Um, our next speaker is my associate, uh, Dr. John Mamarian. Uh, John does not need an introduction. He's past president of ASNIC. He's the director of our CT and nuclear cardiology laboratories. And um, he will take on nuclear cardiology. And let's see what's, uh, what's new in nuclear. John, what's new in nuclear? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're waiting for IT to get things going here. OK. So good morning, and I'm going to try in the next 15 minutes to give you a look at nuclear cardiology. We're going to go through several uh, different areas, perfusion, uh, pharmacologic stressors, uh, different radiation reduction techniques, advances in gamma camera technology and software, and radio tracers, and where we go with those. Now, first of all, as you know, pharmacologic uh, vasodilators have really changed how we do things in nuclear cardiology, but there are a lot of side effects because we're only interested in activating the A2A receptor, and unfortunately, with the denison and dipritamol, we activate many other receptors. However, there are newer uh, agents, such as regadenosin, uh, which specifically or semi-selectively uh, alter or attach or ag activate the A2A receptor. And there have been two studies showing similarity between results in terms of detecting uh, ischemia uh, in the advanced studies with the uh, regadenosin versus the denison, which have shown similarity from sequential adenosin adenosin versus adenosin regadenosin studies. There's also data from our laboratory looking at quantitative information with uh, regadenosin versus adenosin showing very comparable uh, uh, perfusion defect sizes and ischemic defect sizes between adenosin and regadenosin. And in fact, if you put this together, if you look at just an example, you can see on the top an adenosine study, a regadenosine study in the middle, and basically the polar maps, the quantified data, was virtually identical in both of these uh, different uh, studies. So we showed that not only from a visual point of view, in, in terms of visual analysis with the advanced studies, that regadenosine performed as effectively as, as adenosine, but also in quantitative analysis, which means from both a diagnostic and potentially a prognostic uh, point of view, regadenosin should provide the similar kind of information. We also know that the, one of the advantages of the selective A2A agonists is that you can use them in COPD patients and asthmatic patients. There are actually many studies out there that have looked at this, looking at changes in FEV1. Uh, the largest study from Prenner uh, several years ago, uh, looking at changes in FEV1 of greater than 15% which basically show that if you look at an asthmatic group or a COPD group, and you look at placebo, saline infusion versus regadenosin, that there was no worsening in FEV1 with regadenosin versus placebo. And in fact, it, it had no bearing on the initial severity of asthma or COPD. So that's very good news in terms of being able to use this kind of agent in patients who we normally used to use uh, dobutamine, which as nuclear cardiologists and cardiologists in general, we don't like dobutamine because I think we, our heart rates go up higher than the patients when we administer it. Now, there's also some new data uh, from uh, Greg Thomas looking at, uh, at the use of regadenosin in patients who undergo exercise and do not achieve maximal exertion. So, you, a lot of times you like to try exercise first because that's physiologic, and then if the patient doesn't uh, achieve 85% of their predicted heart rate, then you change over uh, to a pharmacologic agent. Well, this study looked actually at randomizing people who had submaximal exercise to either uh, a regadenosin administration while they were on the treadmill or an hour later after they had had a prolonged rest period. And then there was a second, importantly, a second perfusion scan done uh, about a week later uh, in terms of looking at the comparability between the first study stress and the second study using the same initial rest study, which most patients had a rest stress protocol in this, in this trial. So if you look at the hemodynamic effects, no difference in terms of the different uh, uh, protocols, exercise reg MPI-1 or reg an hour later MPI-2 or on the second uh, studies. If you look at blood pressure responses, also no difference. What was interesting is that in terms of secondary endpoints, there was improved image quality with exercise regadenosin versus regadenosin alone. If you look at other secondary endpoints, no difference in side effects. But there were two cardiac events in patients who received 
regadenosine while they were on the treadmill. But importantly, both of these patients had ST segment depression during exercise. So the moral to that story is, if you've already demonstrated ischemia, there's no point in making it worse by giving another pharmacologic agent, okay? So one of the reasons why when you're doing this kind of uh, intervention is that you really should wait a couple of minutes and make sure the patient doesn't develop uh, SD segment depression and recovery before giving regadenosin if they haven't achieved maximal exercise capability. The other interesting factor from this study is looking at the comparability again in terms of results between exercise regadenosin and the second study versus regadenosin an hour later, you know, in, uh, the resting study versus the second resting study. And so you see 73, 74% comparability. But if you look at the number of patients on the second study who developed either an abnormal test result or ischemia, you can see that many patients on the first study who had no evidence of ischemia developed ischemia on the second stress uh, study a week later. And this was whether, irrespective of the randomization. In fact, 8.5% of patients became abnormal on the second study and 5% developed ischemia. And I think that's very interesting because in the first study, rest was always done before stress. In the second study, it was stress alone. And it shows the impact of shine through potentially from the rest injection preventing detection of ischemia. And so in that regard, at least in our laboratory, we always do stress first because that way we're more likely, we feel, to demonstrate ischemia. And this is one of the first data to really kind of give that, give that insight into, the, uh, into the why we should do stress first. With that in mind, there are now two large studies, one from our lab as well as from uh, Milena Henslova's lab, showing the safety of doing stress first with not doing rest if the stress is normal. These are the data. You can see comparability from stress first only or stress only versus stress rest imaging over many years of follow-up. Again, you get much lower doses of radiopharmaceutical because you avoid the high dose rest injection. And as far as, uh, as, as, far as radiation exposure, less than a five uh, millisievert dose in 60% of patients who get stress only. Not only for the patient, but also for your technologists. If you do stress first and stress only, particularly if you use also advanced technology like CZT cameras, you can avoid radiation exposure to your staff by over 50%. This is big news, right, in terms of being able to do that. And in this study, again, by Duvala and Henslova, it showed that 61% of all the reduction in radiation exposure was actually due to stress only as a, as a methodology and then the other 40% using CZT technology, if you look at, at two different time points in terms of when these studies were done. In the new ASIC imaging guidelines, which are just going to be coming out, there's actually a whole now section on why we should do stress first with the idea of doing stress-only imaging. And again, these are in, in, pub, in publication. What's interesting is, despite all of this, if you look at these data from the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was published several years ago in almost 8,000 patients from 300 labs across, the, across uh, the world, you can see that in the US, not only do we do the least amount of stress first across the world, but also, therefore, the least amount of stress only. And of course, that leads to higher radi radiation exposure. We're not being able to reduce radiation exposure in many of those patients. And, in look, and if you look at ASNIC guidelines in terms of achieving less than nine millisieverts of radiation, Actually, North America does the worst in the world where we do most of the studies because of the way we do things. So there really does need to be a paradigm change. Uh, and again, ASNIC and uh, Society of Nuclear Medicine have been promoting this concept of stress only for some time. Now, we can achieve stress only uh, actually fairly easily, even in patients who are large, like in this study, in patients going for bariatric surgery, where 90% of them had normal studies uh, and um, in this study, the vast majority of them actually underwent stress only, 67%, okay? And the way you achieve that is with attenuation correction. And we know attenuation correction significantly improves our ability to call a study normal. And that was shown many years ago. This is just one particular study uh, by Thomas showing improved specificity with AC, particularly in patients with large BMIs.
We also can use prone imaging. This is a patient who had clear-cut evidence of, of a mild reduction in fearly, and then we put the patient on his belly, and that defect is completely gone. Shifting defects in someone uh, who goes from supine to prone automatically indicates normal as long as the ejection fraction and everything else appears normal. So we can achieve stress-only imaging simply by doing these kind of things. What are some other things we can do? We get, obviously, new software techniques are very helpful. Iterative reconstruction rather than filtered back projection. Noise reduction techniques with iterative reconstruction and depth-dependent resolution recovery. We know as the collimator gets further and further away from the target that, that, uh, that resolution is reduced significantly. So by correcting for that mathematically, we can improve images. There are many different papers over the years that have looked at different uh, uh, vendor uh, software iterative reconstruction <coughs> techniques, all of which have shown uh, similar results in terms of improved image quality. This is one study by Madahi, which looked at full-time half-dose versus half-time full-dose uh, using a uh, DigiRad system. And again, you can see identical image, uh, uh, image comparability uh, using this kind of technique, using you know, half the amount of radiation exposure. There's also a lot of new hardware, obviously. We have DigiRad systems. We have Spectrum Dynamics. Uh, which is a pixelated CZT detector array, uh, Semri Upright, and we have the GE Discovery, which is, a, which is a pinhole collimation device, all of which of these systems producing electrons directly in relation to gamma cameras with not, without the need for photomultiplier tubes. Uh, if you look at the uh, different uh, validation studies over the years, they've all shown that you can acquire images much more rapidly and get at least as good imaging as with conventional systems. And in fact, this is one study by Duval looking at, looking at um, five minute rest versus eight minute rest, three minute stress versus five minute stress, and then conventional uh, gamma camera uh, results at the, at the very bottom showing virtually identical results in terms of image quality. And importantly, if you do this kind of issue where you do very, very low dose CZT, you can get to very low levels of radiation exposure. So again, a reason to, to do this kind of technology uh, in terms of uh, advanced iterative software and also advanced uh, 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 gamma camera technology. What else can we do? We know now that with, uh, with doing uh, PET-derived uh, coronary flow reserve, we can get good information. We know that as flow, as flow reserve goes down, uh, irrespective of the amount of obstructive disease, that mortality goes up. And in fact, there tends to be a very poor correlation in general between stenosis severity or the extent of disease and coronary flow reserve. So coronary flow reserve adds. This is just an example of that kind of data. If you have normal coronary flow reserve and low extent of CAD, you do very well. But irrespective if you have whether, whether you have low flow reserve and low CAD or low flow reserve and, and high amounts of CAD or extensive CADs, you still do bad. So coronary flow reserves appears to be important in terms of prognosticating. The other issue is in terms of therapy, if you look at coronary flow reserve high, no revascularization, or coronary flow reserve high, cabbage, people don't do any better. But if you have low flow reserve, you clearly do better with bypass than if you have, than, uh, than not having bypass. So there seems to be some issue of not only diagnosis and prognosis, but also in terms of evaluating therapeutics. We also know that women are more likely to have microvascular disease and have ab abnormal coronary flow reserve, and that women with any degree of coronary flow reserve as it goes down do worse than men. That may also do, have to do with the caliber of their arteries. And interestingly enough, there's also data, this is just one particular study using CCT, but that now there are some data showing that we might be able to do actually coronary flow reserve with SPECT, not only with PET, with some of our newer systems that really have high count rates. So this is also a very important potential uh, advantage in the future. Let's talk about new tracers. How about some of the new uh, PET tracers like F18? This is extremely important, I think, in the future. Uh, we have one F18 agent, fluorpyridaz, which has characteristics that are much better than many of the other agents. 
Flopiridase, for instance, has a much longer half-life, so you can do exercise testing with it instead of just doing pharmacologic stress testing. It also has a very uh, short positron range because it's low energy. And what does that mean? That means that you get much better spatial resolution with an F18 agent than you do with rubidium, for instance, which, has, which is a very, very energetic and, and, and high, um, um, high energy positron. So we think that there are several advantages to, to this particular agent. These are some data from Dr. Berman and Dr. Madahi looking at the first phase three study showing uh, improvement in sensitivity and no worsening in specificity and clearly improvement in image quality with the use of fluorpyridase. And there's a second fluorpyridase study ongoing now, which, and we hope in the next couple of years that this will become a real agent. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about other tracers. This is in heart failure using MIVG. Uh, as we know, in heart failure, the energy-dependent uptake of norepinephrine is, is diminished. Uh, if you look at a normal person you and, and you give MIVG, you can see normal uptake in the myocardium. If you have an abnormal person, you have very low uptake. There are data from the ADMIRE study in almost 1,000 patients showing the value of this. If you look at uh, the composite endpoint of a low heart mediastinal ratio in terms of low uptake in the myocardium, you can see a much higher event rate than a high heart mediastinal ratio. And this is also when you look at heart failure progression and arrhythmia, and particularly arrhythmic death, with a very low incidence of arrhythmic death if you have normal HM ratio. And remember, these are all in patients with EFs that are low, less than 35%, showing how the addition of, uh, of, um, of uh, the HM ratio may be important. This is also data looking at the issues of BNP, LVF, and, and HM ratios. If you look at patients with high BNPs and high H and low HM ratios, they do very bad. But if they have high HM ratios, they do much better. So again, that interaction with clinical data as well as with the HM ratios. And ejection fraction isn't the entire story. Low EF, low HM ratio, bad. Low EF, high HM ratio, still pretty good outcome. And when you look at the Seattle heart failure model, looking at the black line in terms of the, uh, the average uh, score and outcomes, you can see the HM ratio again divides low and high risk. There is another tr study going on right now. We're part of it in this center, looking at the ADMIRE uh, uh, 2 study, used looking at AICD implantation, which is a randomized study looking at the potential value of the heart mediastinal ratio in terms of deciding who would benefit from a defibrillator. Finally, I'd like to just have, spend one more minute talking about other issues of, uh, of using um, PET. One is in sarcoidosis. And uh, depending on the type of abnormality you get, either none or severe in terms of perfusion or high, no uptake versus high uptake uh, in terms of FTG uptake in the myocardium, you can predict outcome. And again, this is some data looking at normal perfusion and normal FTG or no uptake versus abnormal perfusion and, very, and, and, and high FTG uptake in terms of sarcoid. There's also some data looking at FTG in terms of pre, uh, using it with CT to pick up uh, in, in endocarditis in patients. This is an example of a fusion image showing high uptake in the mitral annulus, in the aortic valve, in the mitral valve annulus, which, which was indicative of infection. And this is another study looking at the value of combining those kind of uh, CT and FTG uh, 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 fused images to look at device infections, as in this patient, which had a pocket infection uh, where the, where the uh, pacemaker was located. Finally, we have pyrophosphate imaging, looking at cardiac amyloid. And uh, it turns out that if you have an H, uh, a, uh, a heart to contralateral lung ratio greater than 1.5, uh, it actually it, it has extremely high sensitivity of almost 100% and specificity of 100% for developing ATTR. So in conclusion, I think nuclear cardiology uh, continues to serve us very well. And um, the applications keep expanding. And I wish I had more time to talk about it, but that's a brush stroke of where we are today. Thank you.